Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. You're probably familiar with the old adage, if you don't like the weather in New England now, just wait a few minutes. It's a phrase that holds throughout the seasons. But what if it didn't? What if winter came and never left? It happened. The year was 1816. Newspapers across New England reported frosts in July, freezing temperatures in August, and fears of famine in the fall. Here's historian Howard Coffin with the story of what happened when summer never came to Vermont. The United Church of Bethel, right here smack in the middle of Bethel, Vermont, it was built to last, built of brick, made in a yard just down the street. In the basement is Bethel White, the whitest granite in the world, and it has lasted. This church came into being in what may have been the darkest, coldest year in the history of Vermont. It was known as 1800 and froze to death. No one could have seen what was coming in the winter of 1815 and 16. It was an unusually mild winter, followed by a mild Vermont spring, and summer was coming on nicely until the night of June 5th and 6th, when a mighty snow touched the land, and within three days, snow drifts were as much as three feet deep, and the first crops were beginning to die. The awful year had begun. In July, there were frosts and more snow. In August, in Middlebury, the temperature suddenly went up to 90 degrees and then plummeted below, freezing, and a great drought set in. It became so dry that forest fires broke out in the Adirondacks. The smoke drifted across the lake to Burlington, and visibility there was only a few feet at times. In September, the cold persisted and October began with a foot of snow. The catastrophe was not only in Vermont. It was nearly apparently worldwide. We now know that a great volcano had erupted in the Pacific and spread a great cloud of ash all around the world. In Europe, the writers Lord Byron and Mary Shelley had planned to spend a happy summer in Switzerland, in the Alps, writing happy things. But the clouds descended, the cold came on, and Mary Shelley went indoors to write a novel called Frankenstein. The result of this winter without a summer, as some called it, others called it the starvation year, eventually would mean that up to 15,000 Vermonters would pick up and leave. Among those who left Vermont was a family from Norwich renting a farmhouse down there named Smith. They took with them their son Joseph and went to Western New York State. He, of course, would found the Mormon religion. Most people stayed and many became part of a religious revival. Of course, the darkness and cold brought fear. O oh, Lord, our help in ages past, people flocked to the churches, and of course, they built a new one in Bethel. When the year finally ended, this church had been dedicated on Christmas Eve. With the coming of the new year, something strange happened in Vermont. St. Elmo's fire came from the skies, and the fence posts and trees and church steeples and even people's hair had a great glow about it. What was it? What was this mystery? The mystery deepened, but finally, with spring, came a normal summer, and Vermont's 
1800 and froze to death became a well-remembered history. And we raise our glasses of the fall winter wine with a toast. On this Sunday morning, the congregation of the United Church of Bethel is welcoming in the Christmas season. Decorations are going up and the choir is in good voice. The history of the church has been chronicled by a longtime resident, a member of this community, and someone I'm proud to call a friend. Janet Burnham, historian, author, and deacon of the United Church of Bethel. We're here in her historic home, which I understand to be the oldest house in Bethel Village. And it has something to do, very much to do, with the religious history of this village. Janet. That's true. And it's not the, I don't b believe it's the oldest house entirely in Bethel, but the oldest one in the village, as you said. And um, it was 37 years before they built a church here in town. So before that, they had visiting ministers and so on and so forth. And they had to have it in barns or fields or houses. And this particular room, which they called the four square room, was a place that uh, they often held a church service. So church services were held right here. Yes, right here. And if, if memory serves me, uh, there was a rather famous preacher who would have preached here. Yes, that was Hosea Ballou, who was probably the most influential preacher to forward the thinking about universalism. Do you think there's a connection between oh. uh, the weather and uh, the building of the church? Absolutely, had to be. Uh, they said that, uh, historians say that between 10 and 15,000 people packed up and left Vermont. It could be the world was ending, perhaps. I, absolutely. Um, the end times, like it said in the Bible, you know, the end times. And they would have no way of knowing then that a volcano half a world away was causing the, the weather to act peculiarly. Today, as we begin this celebration of 200 years in this building, what it was that Sunday service at places of worship, like the United Church of Bethel, brings people together. How important are these churches to our communities? They're extremely important in the terms that they have been the anchors of our community since the earliest days. They are built at the head of our towns on a hill at the head of the green. They are part and parcel of what a Vermont village is all about. They were the center of village life as meeting houses and places to congregate for all sorts of things that have kind of fallen by the wayside due to modern society. However, they still remain extremely important because even in a state that is the least churched in the nation, they have a place. They have a place in our lives and in the fabric of our communities. For what do we do for weddings if we don't have them? What do we do with our dead if we don't have a church to carry them to and from to our churchyards and honor them? What do we do if we do not have these places to come to in times of crisis, both nationally and internationally? When we have a local tragedy, it is the place where we still gather. If we ever lose these places, we have lost the soul of Vermont. A Vermont state historic marker will be dedicated on the front lawn of this church. This grand old building will become the official place of remembrance for the year Vermont nearly froze to death. In Bethel, I'm Howard Coffin for Across the Fence. Thank you, Howard. About 550 miles to the south of us in the nation's capital, the annual Cherry Blossom Festival is winding down. Across the Fences, Marco Ayala visited Washington, D.C. a few years ago, and he shares with us the history and color of the festival. Today we're in the nation's capital for one of nature's most spectacular shows, the cherry blossoms. There is quite a story around how the cherry trees that adorn the tidal basin got there. In 1885, Eliza Rahama Sidmore, the first female board member of the National Geographic Society, approached the U.S. Army Superintendent of the Office of Public Buildings and Grounds, asking that cherry trees be planted along the Potomac River. 
but her request was ignored. In 1909, Sedmore decided to take it upon herself to raise the funds needed to purchase the cherry trees, so she wrote a letter to the First Lady, Helen Heron Taft, outlining her plan, and the First Lady was quickly on board. Days later, Dr. Jokichi Takamini, a Japanese chemist visiting DC, asked the First Lady if she would accept the donation of 2,000 cherry trees. On December 10, the trees arrived in Seattle from Japan and started their journey to our nation's capital. Shortly after their arrival, the Department of Agriculture discovered that trees were infested and deceased, and they were ordered to be destroyed. Japan suggested a second donation, and on March 26, 1912, 3,020 cherry trees arrived in D.C. and were planted along the tidal basin. The first Cherry Blossom Festival was held in 1927. Today, the celebration spans four weekends in March and April and attracts more than 1.5 million people from all over the world. Enjoy these images that I was able to take during a visit to our nation's capital.